Oh, I think it's everybody we're expecting in the room. Oh, yes. So, if we can be standing for the karakia, please. Are there on the screen? We need to refer to it. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> Take a seat. Welcome, welcome. Let's start with apologies. We've had apologies from Howard, won't be attending. Asif is late arrival, and it's not an apology, but Tyrone is attending by Zoom. And welcome to everybody on Zoom and on live today. Thanks for coming in. And can I have a mover to accept those apologies, please? Yes. Receive the, receive the apologies. Oh, yes, we're in a briefing today. Fantastic. So everybody's got the right place to be looking at. Come on in. Lorena, 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 Fantastic to have you all here today. Thank you. We're going to start the morning with the Diamond Harbour Land Unsolicited Proposal. And we've got a bunch of people who have come along. Christine Bowes, Danielle, Mark, Stevenson's on Zoom. Uh, Rangi Marie. And yes, welcome on up. Team, Christine and your team, come on up. Just sit at the table. Yeah. Just so we know who's heard and make room for some others. We'll do a bit of shuffling as we go. Sure. Thank you. Oh, yep. Okay. And back a little bit just so I can see what I'm talking to. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, thanks for this opportunity um, to come and have a bit of a discussion with the board about um, I guess what's been received. So the idea of today was just to come in and kind of give an overview of the information that has been received in advance of the report that's coming in April, um, 27th of April. So I do work this thing, do I? Yeah. So just an image of the site, obviously, where it's positioned, um, which everyone will be familiar with. So we're just going to give a quick background, do an overview of the consultation, and then just talk about next steps for the process. So we, we're hoping to not speak for too long, really just to give everyone a good sense of where the project's at, what's come in, and then where things are going. Um, so obviously the site, again, just from above, how that's positioned just above Diamond Harbor. Um, the block of land, um, as was, this is similar, similar information that was in the consultation. So it's located at 27 Hunters Road and 43 Federal Avenue, and it includes 39 hectares. It's been owned by council for over 100 years. And so there has been, there's been a few processes involved, and I think most people are aware of those. But essentially there is an opportunity to look at what happens next with it. Um, so there was some consultation that happened because um, for the most part, it's really just used for grazing. So I guess it was just looking at what's the best and highest use of this land moving forward. Um, um, so as we all know, there's a few gullies along. So this just sort of shows some of the existing features of it. There's three gullies, um, Morgan's Gully, Sam's Gully. And it's kind of referred to as the other gully or school gully, but that's the other, I guess there's been a lot of revegetation that's happened on the site by the community. So a lot of community input and use with walkways and pathways and natural waterways. Um, and it's surrounded primarily by residential <coughs> and zone residential. Uh, there, so following the consultation that happened about disposing the land, there was some um, further discussion with the community about what the best use would be and the a number of um, suggestions and feedback was received by the community. And so 
the idea was to start a, st a spatial plan process, which staff have started. So part of what that had looked at was what the different land use options are, responding to the very strong feedback from the community about the protection of the gullies and how important that was, and just how access and infrastructure on the site would work. So no major decisions have been made. It was really just starting to look at what was involved in that. Um, there were some high level technical assessments that had just been starting to be looked at in terms of, you know, what are the conditions, what are the slopes like, what vegetation is there, where are the boundaries, et cetera. And at that time, um, this just talks about the past consultation. At that time, a um, submissions had been received for, considerations had been received for unsolicited proposals for the use of the land moving forward. Um, so that's really the topic of what we're here for today. Um, and so two submissions were received, one for a new site for Fire and Emergency New Zealand. Um, and they had actually selected, there were some sites around the area, but this was a site in a position that was selected by FENS based on that, some of that conversation, as well as um, the gully that's next, sitting to be unnamed or the school gully um, and Sands Valley Gully, which um, Tapa had identified as one that would be suitable um, for a school site. Yes, that just overviews um, what the unsolicited proposals were for. So the FENS site includes half a hectare, and the um, DePa site includes eight hectares of land. And just a little bit of background in terms of what, what that includes. And so part of the considerations for friends is that their current site is not feasible to keep running. So it's an earthquake um, condemned building. So they actually need to find a new facility. Someone from, is someone from friends, someone from friends that came in to attend? I wasn't sure if they'd been invited, so I'm not sure if they were able to come. Um, but really they're looking for something for the future. Um, so just very functional, practical uses. To replace the site that they are currently, which is just shown in the corner, um, is too, really too small for what they need for the future. So they had identified this site as being one that would meet those needs. Um, and in terms of Tapa, um, they looked at this site and there's been some high level consideration of it, but there's been no detail um, worked on that so far. There are representatives of Tapa in the room um, if there's questions left or clarifications. But essentially what council is looking at here is for a conditional land sale. So there's been no detailed work, there's been no specific in-depth considerations or investigations. What the process is for this, and Stuart can probably can, uh, can get, me, get me straight if I get you say the wrong thing, but essentially it's there's an interest in the land um, in terms of partnering with Minister of, the, uh, Minister of Education um, to Paul is working with them to, to determine whether this site would be suitable. But the first step in that is determining if this land is available. And so that's why it's a conditional sale on the land. So, and that's the other reason why you're not seeing a bunch of detailed proposals. Mm -hmm. We don't have any information about transport and access and soils. That would come next. So before the Ministry of Education would go ahead and start a feasibility study, that would provide some of that more in-depth information. They would need to know, first of all, of this land um, could be sold to them. So that's why this process is probably a little bit different than a lot of the processes that you'd see typically um, because it's an unsolicited proposal. So the decision that ultimately is being asked to be made for both friends and for TAPA is whether or not, um, I guess we should carry on with that conversation and what those conditions could look like. Yeah, that's, yeah, no, that's correct. What we'll be asking the board to recommend to council depends out that way. In the report written is that um, will we sell the land to fins and to par? So board and wake recommendation to council. So that's what's being considered whether we sell the land or not. There will be, as Christine touched on, a whole lot of conditions associated with that. Um, um, there may be doing feasibility such study as a feasible if there was school site there, we're going to get the children there. How are they going to get back? Um, so it's purpose of due diligence. It'll be so also some funding, land investigation, resource building consents. Um, also, we'd like to enter into a covenant that if a school is not built, the council have the option to purchase the land back and we can speak to the civil. 
Since we just want to make sure there was some clarity on that, the purpose of today is obviously not about any decision making. This is just a workshop. Um, and I th just thought it was prudent for staff to attend and just give some of that early information about the consultation process today and just kind of reiterate those kind of the foundations of why we're here and what that's what that's all about to support, I guess, the community as well and understanding the proposal. Can I just ask a question? You may have mentioned this, but the feasibility study by MOE. When can that be done? When, if, if there has been a proposal from the community board to say that that would be a good step forward to sell a recommendation, is it then or is it after it? They're, they're doing some high level work at the moment, but the difficulty is if there's no agreement for sale and purchase in place, they don't want to commit. Okay, so, so the agreement of it would be triggered because it's, it's, it's you can imagine it'd be some quite in-depth and expensive sure. reporting that needs to happen in technical mm -hmm. assessments and so that's why they won't start that work okay. until they have a conditional sale um and so that's why and the proposed and the process for unconditional for the unsolicited proposals is to take that to the public before anyone makes any of those agreements so the idea is just to make sure that we're being really transparent and open about what's happening um, and we present I guess the considerations as much as we know now it's a bit of a tricky one because we know for a lot of people that we've spoken to it is definitely a bit of a chicken and egg thing it's like what is this going to look like um, but this is very early in the process yeah um, it's good that so, it gives me some idea of the timeline yeah, and what needs to be done the, yeah. the, the community well the the council decision will break the chicken and egg cycle. Yep. It will work direction. Thank you. Very well put. Um, we're going to hand it over to Danielle shortly. Sure. 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 Um, so I'll hand yeah, it over to Daniel. Awesome. Um, so I wanted to just give a very high level overview of the consultation and some of the feedback that we've had. Um, you'll get the full analysis breakdown of submissions at, uh, when you get the report um, and also a breakdown of all the tactics. So I'm just keeping it high level today. Um, but we received 424 submissions um, during our consultation period, which ran from the 26th, uh, 22nd of January to the 19th of February, uh, which is an impressive amount of submissions. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide. So, um, you know, oh, sorry, 420, yeah, 428, 424 individuals, a couple of organisations. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so yeah, just up here, I thought I'd just give an overview of kind of the general sentiment received from just the yes or no questions um, that we had in our consultation form. So this, for this one, the, the question was simply, is the proposed fire station um, a good use for the outlined part of the land? Um, we got most in support, so 85% either fully or somewhat agreed with the proposal and that for the use of part of the site. Um, we had 40 that um, were somewhat, and then 326, which were in full support, um, 39 that were a no and raised some concerns and considerations, um, and then 22 that were on the fence, weren't sure. Um, just a breakdown of some of the sort of top themes that came through regarding the fire station. So as you can see, um, lots of people thought that it would be an asset to the community, uh, general support without any specifics. Um, understand that the facility would meet the growing needs of both the local community and the brigade, um, and also noted that the helipad is a beneficial amenity. In terms of concerns, um, there were some concerns raised around the safety of the access road, so where the um, vehicles would get in and out of that site because it's, they've noted that there's some low visibility and some tight bends on that road, um, and then some concern for noise impacts related to the use of sirens. Um, and then the top sort of requests that came through were just around, again, relating to the sirens, how they could be managed and restricted just to ease some of the noise impacts. Um, and then if some safety improvements could be made around the access point just to make it safe. And then um, for the question around the school, the yes or no question around whether the outline section for the designated character school would be a good use for part of the site. Um, we had 69% of submitters fully or somewhat agree um, with the proposal, uh, 274 of which fully supported, 24 of which somewhat supported, um, 119 that didn't and had some points of concern or some questions related to that, and then 14 that yeah, weren't sure. Um, and then some of the 
top themes that came through through the um, comment section for the, the submissions were around supportive aspects. They saw that the facility would be an asset to the local community. They noted the appropriate, appropriateness of the proposed site culturally, geographically, practically. Um, they anticipate benefits to Manafinoa from the proposed facility and that they see a demand or a support body medium education. Um, some of the concerns were around the roading infrastructure, um, travel logistics of getting students and staff to and from the site, uh, and then also relating to that, the environmental impacts of transporting um, people to and from the site. And then there was also concern for negative impacts on the existing school and kindergarten in Diamond Harbour. And then in terms of the top requests that came through, some people noted that an alternative location could be sought, sometimes um, saying maybe something more central. And then um, people noted that priority could be to support or expand the current school or integrate to par with the current school. That's so I guess in terms of what comes next, um, what, like, as I mentioned, we just wanted to come here today to have an opportunity just to kind of face up to, to the board and let you know kind of what we've been hearing in advance of the report that will be starting to be written um, in the next couple of days with staff recommendation. So staff will come to the community board. I think we've got something booked in on the 22nd of April. And as I understand, people are currently making, if they wanted to come and make deputations to that meeting, it's a what type of meeting that people can make deputations okay. at that time? So yeah. open meeting where people can make deputations, and so there's a an invite out there for yeah. people to do that. Um, and staff will make a recommendation at that time, and then that recommendation will ultimately go up to council. Uh, we've currently booked in a date on the 15th of May of this year to go to council with that report. That is subject to um, council being available at that time. So we put in a booking, but sometimes we do get shunted. Typically back um, out, but we're you know we've locked that one in and we'll see if, how, that, how that lands. Um, and then ultimately that would be council's decision to support that conditional sale or not. So this is a process that's happened before with the board that typically we, we would come to the community board first. This is a community issue that goes a recommendation goes up to council and a decision gets made there. Um, in terms of the spatial planning process, so we have indicated that it's likely that we'll kind of pause on that a little bit until there's more certainty on what happens with the school site and the fence site, just so that we know, um, because they're obviously quite important pieces. And so we don't want to push too much further with spatial planning until we have a good understanding of what happens with those. Um, so I guess part of the other reason we've got to be useful to come and sit in front of you today is really just to get a sense as we're preparing the staff recommendation um, to get a sense from the community board what sort of things you would like us to be considering as part of the staff recommendation because obviously you've got considerations as well and so that's I guess we just sort of wanted to present this information to wrap it up and, and really just hand it back to yourself so that give us some clarity in terms of what you'd like to say. Great, yes, so I hear from you. Fantastic. I had a couple of questions. Um, one was, so the eight hectares, um, is that a separate legal parcel of land, or I assume it must be, but I don't know. No, it's not. It would be subject to subdivision. Okay. <laughs> so, so somehow that boundary has been arrived at. That basically follows the fence line okay. between the raised area and the gullies at the moment. Okay. Yep. And my other question was, um, so you mentioned that the um, the existing site of fins is not suitable for some reason because uh, it's too small. I think it's an earthquake. Well, the, so it sounds like the building is must be earthquake prone, but the land itself it's not big enough. Big enough. Um, to me, yeah. it looked like it was similar size. Does look similar size? No, the, the, I think the diagram is slightly yeah. misleading. It's only the wee square um, cave pit that was on there that was. Actually, there. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, even then, I don't think it's to scale. But okay. be, um, they, they need a better site, but they would also be able to have wash down facilities, potentially a health pad um, oh. on site. Mm. It would be a superior site for it. Oh, yeah. It'd be quite, I would quite like to see like exactly how much land they have um, now. Yeah, yeah. compared to. Well, oh, yeah. 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 Make sure that goes in the report. 
I guess um, feedback as well, so that the folk can go away and. I think it's good. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any questions for the public to consider. It's a good stage, it's very interesting. Uh -huh. I think we're interested to hear what submissions will come in. Mm -hmm. What are they I find it quite helpful to have a little bit more detail around some of the um, concerns about the aspects of the proposals and some of the potential fixes. So a bit more detail on those fixes would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have that noted there that this could be done, but what would that, you know, without going into too much detail, what that would require and yeah, so that we can just weigh that up. Is that even the possibility for that to be mitigated if it's a real issue for the community? That would be really helpful for me. There was, there was some good detail in some of the submissions, I believe, as well, Danielle, that we last staff to sort of work through was it specific. So yeah, and then the submissions obviously have a lot more specific examples. Right, okay. To help yeah. by staff okay. what we're looking at. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so this consultation process, you uh, community was given two options to choose from that what we would what we think about and and Japan. Was they given any other option of what would the community would like to do with their land? Was there a question there? So um we had yeah question questions directly related to Tapa, the Tapa proposal, the Fence proposal, and then we also asked for any general comments around that would help us to advise spatial planning for the whole site. Um, and I did note down a couple of sort of themes that had come through that, and it will be um, detailed in full in the, in the report. Um, but there was a lot of sort of comments around ecological regeneration, so planting, conservation, um, protecting the existing gullyways and the walkways that are already there and also enhancing them further. Um, some people were quite happy with some of the grazing that's already going on. Um, there was some comments about residential housing often referred to as low density um, or for people to age in place um, and then there was also comments around community services and facilities a lot of them relating to outdoor recreation um, and then there was just some sort of general notes around infrastructure upgrades for the whole site okay so what happened to those questions uh, those comments they were they're just there or is cancelled into any of those ideas further so i believe that that will help our project team that are doing the spatial planning um so that will help advise their spatial plan that they'll hopefully come out with say later in 2024 yeah i think we just want to get a good understanding where this lands um because obviously you know the particular to site it's quite a larger central strip as well as with fans and how it'll operate so once we find out how they'll use it, we'll put that back into the spatial planning process. So there was already a consultation that was done in 2022, but a lot of that feedback is kind of fed into where we're at now, but this would just kind of further um, add to that because it's more, more recent as well. And in between now that you are writing the report and giving the presentation on the 2nd of April, would we get any deposition or feedback from the community in relation to that? Would that data be included in the report or is it just... So I think we'll um, we'll touch on that feedback that came through submissions, and obviously you're able to read all the submissions in full if you'd like, um, and that will be shared with our project team to help them with the ongoing spatial planning. Thank you. So anything that comes in afterwards, can it be considered if it's coming in between now and? Yes, now. Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't be part of the submission analysis because it's not a formal submission. Okay, if they make a deprecation to this board. Oh, that, that's considered by the board, yeah. So we would be expecting um, deputations to the meeting on the 22nd. Um, because there were so many submissions, um, that's why we've allowed um, the whole day 
really. Um, and we've started, we've sent out the first calendar bookings mm -hmm. because anyone who wants to speak um, is able to book online their slot to speak. So we've opened up the first hour of the meeting for those bookings now. And if that fills up, we'll open up a second hour and we'll keep going through like that until we've catered for everybody who wants to speak. Um, so your your mission is to listen to all of those deputations to have analysed and understood um, the report. If you have any questions on the report, um, we would like those through in the writing before the, uh, the meetings on a Monday. So we would need those by the end of the Thursday before, because then we would provide those to staff. It gives them one day on the Friday to um, be able to provide a response to those questions. Um, and then at the meeting itself, of course, you have deputies who speak a lot and you may have further questions which you can put to staff at the meeting, but that, because it's quite short, you may or may not be able to get an answer depending on those questions. So we're wanting to really front load all of the questions mm. and all of the information and that's what today is about. So you can ask or identify questions that you'd be, you know, tra trains of thought you'd be looking for. Um, yep, and as well as that, of course, um, residents um, can talk to their local elected members or anybody on the community board. Um, I'm sure some will. Um, I'd be surprised if people didn't get into your ear because that's that's what you're there for, right? So, um, yeah, so you'll be hearing from the community, you'll be reading the information, you'll have the deputations at the meeting, and then you'll have your debate and discussion. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, we've tried to make it as thorough um, and as open and transparent yeah. as possible. Um, we also have um, members uh, from the Depar School here today, if you have specific questions that staff can't answer or um, lines of thought that you want explained or followed. Um, yeah, so this is a good opportunity, um, you know, to ask. And we don't have any good friends in the room now. No. So oh. then after our process, then it's either a reason consent process or maybe designation of the, those two organisations. If, if the recommendation from the board to council is to sell the land, yes, there is then the resource consent process after that. Yeah. When all that yes. stuff about suitability of site and transfer and all that all comes out again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. feasibility of getting the kids there, et cetera. Yeah. That, that could take a year to yeah. Um, I have a question for any representatives from Tepa, uh, if they're comfortable or can. Um, so I know transport is one of the issues to and from school, and that's obviously been raised as a concern as well. Is that something that you're working behind the scenes to yeah, expand on that bit a little bit? Uh, 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 not to figure out. Um, so, sorry, my name's Mana, um, representative of Tutupa. We have been working on um, various transport models. Um, one of them is to uh, transport on a boat across uh, and then uh, by a minivan uh, take them up to the site. So, there's been a lot of consideration put into that, and there's still further um, that we working with um, Black Cat potentially in the future as well as uh, ECAM um, on the suggested routes to help us. Um, the main real consideration here is flow and what we've noticed is um, when we would be actually going across the Diamond Harbour, um, it would be against the flow of the normal traffic coming out of right. the Diamond Harbour. So yeah. we believe that there would be reasonably minimal impact um, on Diamond Harbour community. The other part to it is that we will currently have a site uh, within the town, and that's where we'll be doing the pickups and drop offs. Um, so parents will be picking up and dropping off their students there. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's not a big impact of uh, lots of cars traveling through to um, Diamond Harbour. 
Um, but like what has been said already, um, there's further detailing that we need to kind of get to to kind of confirm um, that we, we aren't um, doing too much impact on, on the current community. Mm -hmm. Right, thank yeah. you. Okay. Any other questions for Mana? Um, uh, when you said, Mana, that you had a, a, a site in town, yes. do you mean in Diamond Harbour? Uh, Diamond oh, Diamond okay. We have a site, so the proposal that we have is that we'll have two sites. Um, currently, you may be aware that our modern medium uh, within the Christchurch region, um, we are at capacity. Um, so currently we operate out of the Linwood site and we're looking to use that and um, rebuild that site as well as um, at Diamond Harbour. Uh, the significance of moving to Diamond Harbour uh, is to do with uh, the tile, uh, which you would have seen in the weekend, uh, how, how spectacular it is. Um, but our mother whenua, Matafiki, um, is um, what we call our kura iwi, so that's the iwi that we align to, um, and we prefer to have our school sitting within our park. <coughs> so there's two sites, um, that's what you want to say. Uh, probably the other significant uh, part to also mention is that the role we currently is around about 220. We're not looking to extend um, up to 700 until uh, 12 years later. Okay, so there's a role growth that will occur. So, so it will be adaptive approach. And the role split between the two schools. So you wouldn't have, um, on day one, if we were to go to uh, Tapataka or Dunn Harbour, um, at the end of one day, we're probably looking at about 120, up to 150 people. Thank you. Uh, Asif, did you have a question? Asif, yeah, part of his yeah, answer, yeah. Um, I don't know who to ask this. Um, the terminology was used as designated character school. Is it how the school uh, run or the model of the school, or is it something different? Uh, so the designation um, is that we are uh, 152, so a special character school. So we, we're a Māori medium, uh, which means that um, we teach our traditional uh, learners um, at school. Um, our target audience are 98%, I believe, Māori um, that will attend, or currently attend the school at the moment. And we're based on our two points. Ancestors. Um, so, Raka Hauti, the name that you use for uh, your board, is the Tupuna that we talk to, uh, and all the attributes of that Tupuna as is what we can like uh, teach uh, our uh, students um, that it's meant and the values that we hold to it. So, it is a special character, but it's not a mainstream school. No. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right, that looks like it's a lot of the questions answered. Did anybody have any feedback directly to um, Christine here yeah, as far no, as what that. we would love to see in the report? <laughs> 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 as far as what we would like to see and you know what would be helpful for us in making you know, this recommendation in the report. Um, I feel there's been a few questions asked there and maybe some requests for feedback. Um, is that helpful? Okay, great. Lovely. Thank, Thank you very you much for your time. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Very well done. Uh, we've got a next people due to come in at 10 past 11 for the dog control bylaw policy review. We're a little ahead of time. Let's see if we can juggle some things around. <laughs> We're just going to pause the live stream for those online at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate you coming today.
Det kan se.
introduction, I think, as soon as we go live. We are live. We are live. Okay. Oh, where did it go? Hi. Can we start with um, introductions from you and then we'll go around sure. the table so you know where we are all from? First of all, apologies for that again. We thought we were late <laughs> <laughs> waiting for us. So. Um, thank you. I'm Tina Crocker. I'm from the policy team and I'm uh, leading the uh, review of the dog control bylaw policy, which we need to talk to you about today. Okay. I'm um, Bill Corby, so I'm acting manager of animal management for a while as well. Uh, and when he's here, I'm principal advisor for animal management. Mm -hmm. okay. Asif, do you want to start with yeah. me? My name is Asif Stan uh, from the Force of Division. I'm Mihikia Tutu from Wana Sundas Tukuma, and the Wana and the representative for the Natural Law. Andrew Harrison, Peter uh, Chia. And for Kara, I'm uh, Lynn, and I'm the chair of the board, but also based here in Wairiwa. Uh, kia ora, Cor Penelope Goldstone, Tukuringawa Community Governance Manager for the Council. Kia ora, Cor Jolene Fraga, I'm the new community board member for Lincoln. Kia ora, Kathy and I'm from the Village Subdivision. Thank you. Um, am I, I'm driving? Yes. He's yeah. pointing this. Yeah. Pointing it over there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we're here to talk to you today about this review. Um, we're in the early stages of it, and so we're keen to get any input from you of any areas that you're concerned about or any feedback about what you're hearing in the community um, around dog control. So the Dog Control Act was um, created in 1996, and there were three main reasons why it was developed. Um, one was because there had been um, some attacks on Kiwi up in Northland, so we were just definitely a wild, wildlife protection focus that the Act has. Um, there had been a lot of uh, quite horrific um, bites, particularly to children, um, a lot of front page newspaper stories where there's a need to better protect vulnerable people in our communities. Uh, and there was a, a rising number of uncontrolled dogs, so packs of dogs roaming the streets, and it wasn't clear who should be looking after them or controlling them. So that's the kind of main reason that the Dog Control Act came about, and the policy and bylaw that we're talking to you about today and made under that legislation. Um, so uh, all councils are required to have a policy on dogs and a bylaw to enforce it. So it's our only bylaw where we have to have a policy with it, and they sort of talk to each other and work together. Um, up there, you can see the main reasons, uh, the purpose of a dog control policy for a council. So it focuses on um, just reducing danger, distress, and nuisance, and on um, making sure that we have control of public spaces for dogs, and that it's not just about protecting people from attack, but also from fear of intimidation or attack. So we've got to make sure that we have some dog-free spaces in public areas. Um, and we also have to balance this with providing for the recreational needs of dogs and their owners. So mm. there's a lot that the policy has to do. Um, this is a little bit of a pull of some of the data that we hold, but important to note here that we only hold information about attacks if people report them to us. So there's a lot of unreported attacks and other things that are happening. And you'll see there that the um, attacks on animal and wildlife are quite low, but that's again, we don't get told, um, so we can't record it. Um, that's just over the last three years. So the, um, we've had the policy in place since 2016. Um, um, but it just shows you that we've had quite a big increase in the number of dogs, registered dogs. We've got a high per capita dog ownership in this district. Um, and um, we tend to do formal uh, warnings before we issue infringements, so tickets for people that are doing the wrong thing. But our preference is to talk to people and encourage them to do the right thing because we're looking for good outcomes, not to punish people. Um, but we will take that action where it's appropriate. Um, and the dog control team does a lot of work with uh, barking dogs and we get a lot of different uh, feedback and that can be, that's just a capture, it doesn't really tell us what that feedback's about, but we know that people are often more likely to take to social media to complain about things than to report it to the council. So there's a, a gap in what information we have. Reality. Um, so the policy and bylaw must do certain things and they can do certain things, so that's all specified in the Act. Um, so we have to have both, so we work together. Um, important to note that the Dog Control Act itself applies across the whole country, so that already sets a whole lot of standards and offences and things and protections in place. So the policy and bylaw are about local things that are particular to our district, so that's the, that's the focus of it. 
Um, we have to do a formal review of it at least once every 10 years. So we've had it for about eight years at the moment. It's a very involved process. It's the same process as starting from scratch. And we've got to um, prepare certain documents and we have to consult with all the people. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a big formal process. Um, so obviously the policy, it's statutory policy has to meet the requirements of the Act. Um, it enables us to help put some of those protections in place that are particular to our district. Um, we can set obligations for dog owners that can um, complement or add to what's already in the Act. It sets the dog registration category, so the policy itself doesn't set the dog registration amounts, um, but it sets the category. So we've got dog owners, we've got um, D6 dogs, we've got a different um, higher fees for um, dangerous and menacing dogs. Um, so that the, the amounts are set through the annual plan process, but we set the structure up through the policy. Um, and it has to do certain things around dangerous and menacing dogs, which are classifications under the Act. Um, we've also got some stuff in there around how to run the dog shelter and also things like education um, and other requirements. So it's quite a comprehensive document. This is that it's all online, but it's, um, it's, it's, it's got quite a lot of information in it. Um, and we also, we've structured it not just as a um, regulatory tool, but as an educative tool. So the idea is that it helps people to understand their obligations and why we've got those rules in place because they're more willing to comply and do the right thing if they understand the reason for the, the, the requirements. So this is just to get involved. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, two dogs need to be leashed on roads. Yes. yes, they do, and also footpaths. So anywhere where there are vehicles moving, and in this review we're looking at clarifying that it applies to shared pathways where we've got pedestrians and cyclists and people on scooters and wheelchairs and all sorts of other things. Um, so they have to be leashed on roads. A lot of people don't think that they do, or they, they think that they've got good control mm. over their dog, but it's you can't always anticipate unexpected things. There might be a loud motorbike, there might be some noises, there might be a cat running somewhere. Dogs can be unpredictable, and it's about protecting a dog as much as it is about protecting um, traffic and not causing an accident. Do dogs need to be leashed on beaches? Mm -hmm. Certain beaches. Certain beaches. Certain beaches. Certain beaches. Certain beaches. So yes, exactly. Certain yeah. beaches. So we have the summer beach pro prohibition area. So in the in the city coastline, that's either side of the surf life saving clubs, but on the peninsula, it's specified. Beaches, not on beaches, just ones that are commonly used for swimming. Um, and that's within certain months and times. And you can take your dog through the beach area as long as it's on a short leash and you're passing through. You can't remain in there within those hours with your dog. That's to protect people that are swimming, kids from being knocked over. Um, protect belongings and things like that. We also have some bits of beach, particularly around the peninsula, where dogs are prohibited, and that's to protect wildlife, so yeah. penguins and seals and, and bird colony. Mm -hmm. Do owners need to carry plastic bags? Or yeah. we've been pulled up on these the plastic, plastic bags. The yeah. men are picking up after their dog. <laughs> yes. yes, they do. And that was a change we put in last time. That's been really successful. Yeah. There's been really wide acceptance of it. But we had um, people who were taking their dog for a walk and they would just go, Well, I didn't bring anything, mm. so I can't. But we were like, You actually have an obligation to have the appropriate means and to pick up your dog. That's not an excuse. And so that's an offense in the bylaw. Um, is it okay for dogs to chase seagulls? Or Yes. Turns out that dogs can't tell the difference between endangered species and common birds, so no, no chasing of any wildlife, you have to keep your dog in good control of that wildlife. Um, but often, they do. Like it doesn't matter if they're just chasing, they're just having fun, but it's not fun for the bird, and birds are often fighting for their life, and certainly endangered birds um, that are nesting on the ground, if they get scared, they'll fly off the nest, and then they won't return for a period of time, and the eggs can be unviable. So it's a, re it's a really big concern, and people need to take very good care. Yeah. Um, yeah, any wildlife. What was under effective control? <laughs> <laughs> so in, in the district, if, if public areas, if they're either prohibited or leashed, or the default, if they're not prohibited or leashed, is under effective control. Mm -hmm. There are three parts to it. Is anyone that has a guess? Yes. Well, the effective control is on, on a lead, but also they must respond to verbal um, commands. Um, What's the third bit? Does it need to go on the lead? It, it's well, that's part of that. It can be. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely good control if you've got it on the lead. You have to know where your dog is and what it's doing. Right. Oh, it needs to be close enough for it to respond to commands, and it can't be creating a nuisance to any other dogs or animals or wildlife. So that's not, and to people as well, so not running up to people and scaring mm -hmm. them, especially children who, you know. Um, so it's really about having your dog close to you and knowing what it's doing. If it's off, you know, you don't know what it's up to. It might be um, you're not going to pick up your up after your dog if you don't know what it's doing. It could chase something. So it's really about having that good control um, where in public places. And how many dogs does one person control in a public place? 
Oh, is it two? There is a rule at the moment, but we're looking at putting one in. So we're getting an increasing number of dog walkers with a lot of dogs on leashes or bringing a van load of dogs to um, dog parks. And you can't be in control of nine dogs no, at once in different right. directions. You can't see them. It's not physically possible. So we're looking at putting that in place to just help set some expectations. This is some sort of dog whisperer wizard type. Well, it's probably quite rare to have those. I haven't actually met one yet. I'm going to tell you that they are. Um, so you may have seen this. Hopefully, if you're a dog owner, you've seen this. So this is um, a whole of our interactive map online. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can look at any of those coloured areas and zoom in on them. And you can, if you hover over them, you'll get the, the particular um, description of why those areas are regulated and what the regulation is. So. Where it says prohibited leashed, for example, you have to go into the entry to see that dogs are prohibited um, from the park, but they can be on a leash within the pathways. So we have that sort of description in there. Um, so there's a lot of different dog control categories there. We also, there's 155 of them. They're all specified in the policy and as in the review, we're going through all of those areas and looking at whether they're fit for up to date, whether there's other areas we should add or whether we need to make adjustments. Um, there's three general prohibited categories, so that's um, all children, council children's playgrounds, all um, council paddling pools and all skate parks. Mm -hmm. Three general leash categories, which is the roads and footpaths, um, the memor memorials and cemeteries, and um, boat ramps and slipways. So they, we thought rather than have to specify all those individual bits of land, they were easy enough concepts for people to understand so we can mm -hmm. create general categories rather than listing every single cemetery or every single playground is ridiculous, hundreds of them. Um, so they're the, they're the categories that we have at the moment. Um, so key areas as part of this review. So um, the estuary is a key area. We've had a lot of um, interest in us mm -hmm. prohibiting dogs more broadly from around the estuary and on the estuary. At the moment, we have key high priority wildlife protection areas, um, but there's, there's, a, there's a high interest in us um, prohibiting dogs more broadly. Um, on and around the estuary um, in, in this uh, East Asian Austral Australasian flyway. So that's the international mm -hmm. network of wetlands and other places where um, migratory birds need to stop on their big global journey. Um, and the estuary is one of those areas. So that's another reason you've got very tired birds coming, you've got endangered birds. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so I want for better protection here. So we're looking at what, what makes sense. Residential red zone, of course, when we last at this in 2016, most of that land wasn't back with the council in terms of management. So we need to look at the whole of the red zone and work out uh, what's appropriate. Quite difficult because we don't, we might know what the future use of the land is, but it's not used for that at the moment. Then people aren't necessarily going to want to follow rules. So we're looking at how we can take a flexible approach and get some future proofing in there. Um, noting, of course, that there's a lot of um, biodiversity and habitat restoration and a lot of sets to varies, particularly along waterways and margins. Um, so that's a challenge for us. Um, and all the new drainage basins. So we've got a lot of engineered um, stormwater and wetland areas. And because they weren't regulated, they're under effect for control. So people are bringing in their dogs, mm -hmm. um, which for some people feel is really nice. And other people, they'd like better protection, either to have dogs leashed or to um, prohibit dogs where we're trying to bring in wildlife. Um, and then other issues we're looking at, um, things like the um, how many dogs can you control in a public place. Um, we're getting reports, particularly on the beach, of people wearing noise cancelling headphones and scrolling on their phone. You're not in good control of your dog. If you mm -hmm. can't see it or hear it, you don't know if it's barking or chasing or getting into a fight with another dog. Um, and any other areas that we're getting feedback from the animal management team or um, through the community boards and others, got proposals up. So this. Um, Report and information will go to the full council and then it will be adopted with a consultation and then come out for full consultation. So we're a ways away from that process. That's much later in the year. Um, so later in the year, we'll be doing public consultation. We're, the legislation requires us to notify every registered dog owner and to undertake wider consultation. So it's, a, it's one of the reasons why we don't review this document often because um, it's a, a great big amount of work, not only the legal requirements, but also the consultation requirements. Um, we encourage you, of course, to make a submission. There's a lot of seats to areas around the peninsula that we need to protect. I think of the 155 areas, about 60 of them are around the peninsula. Um, so we're just interested in any early feedback you've got for us on the, what's happening at the moment, any areas for improvement or things that you think we've missed off in the last review or things that have changed since then. Back to the map. The map. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dog. Here we go. 
Um, so in the in the policy itself, it lists all the areas and it lists you know the status and then the reason why we've got all those restrictions in place. Um, as I did the review last time, and as issues have been coming up, I have been making note of them, and I have quite extensive notes over the years of all the areas that have come up. And I know just off the top of my head, Wainui Beach was one area that we had um, people say we should put a summer beach prohibition in there. Yeah. Um, Stanley Park in Ekaroa has um, grazing and other things. That was an area that we don't have regulated at the moment. Um, but any, yeah, any ideas or feedback you've got, if not now, then, then later is fine. But if we can weave them into the review, then that helps us rather than coming with, you know, a proposal. How many, how many complaints did you have with Stanley Park? Oh, I don't think we've had specific complaints necessarily. I just know that it came up after after the review last time. Someone said, oh, we probably should have put that in there. That's the only reason I remembered it. Um, I think there's least dogs allowed in there. Right. I don't think it should be worse than that. No, I I thought, I mean, I thought there was a complaint that was grazing. Who owns a sheep doesn't have any dogs in there. No, but we do on the Port Hills on a lot of land where we have grazing, we have a leashed requirement or we prohibit, and that's partly we used to have seasonal restrictions around lemming, but that got too confusing. But if you're not a farm person, you don't really know when and it happens. So um, we just made it a blanket restriction. There's always a balance here around how much detail, given we've got you know <laughs> hundreds of areas, and how much detail if we change things seasonally or if we only require some things sometimes or if we have those split levels. Um, but I mean, I'm I'll have other things on my list that I haven't. Mm. Brought to you, but I, it's more about whether you have feedback. I know Littleton's some issues around the mm. sports field and people worried about people yeah, picking up their dogs. That's what I wanted to talk yeah. about. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. interested in, in mm. like, from my colleagues, mm. yeah, which is the issue we've got is that there's no real with the dog in Littleton. Mm. I don't, I'm not a dog owner myself, mm. but, um, yeah. but um, yeah. you know, when people go around to the sports room, go to the ring. Yeah. Yeah. And it used to be. I mean, yes, I mean, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be leashed. You can walk your dog here, right? And, and you have to pick them up to your dog. Yeah, yeah. so it's the balance there. Yeah, the rugby club yeah. kind of it was a, became a bit of an issue because, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Kids yeah. playing rugby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not a. Oh, look, I mean, I played a lot of football down there, and like the first thing you do yeah. <laughs> in the pre yeah. yeah. football yeah. game is, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and every week is out there. Yeah. But in the summertime, there's actually no sport played on there right. at all, I don't think. They don't play cricket down there anymore, do they? No. But they used to be oh. social football on oh, Sunday, yeah. and often the, even the crews from the boats come over. Oh, yeah, yeah. but yeah. that's kind of like right. un, unregulated, if yeah. you like. It's just sort of stand-up games. Yeah. yeah, but still, they don't but want to no run the stepping in dog poo. No, <laughs> and, and, and whoever is taking their dog there and isn't picking after is already breaking the law. Terms of what so it's a question of that mismatch if you can put the great law in place, but if people don't understand it or aren't willing to comply, then you know it's not it's not going to work. So but it has caused a great deal of consternation, no yeah. matter yeah. bringing in the that, that leashing thing in it. I don't know if we could some again we'd have to probably work this through the reserve committee. You'd prefer it wasn't mm -hmm. leashed. I think. I think. I mean, what, what, I think what, what it was. standard is to do is have their yeah, yeah. distracted or something. Yeah, it's and, an and it's their, they see it as their only chance for people, for dogs to run the Yeah, and place. so they throw the ball and dog runs back. Yeah. We we need to be careful too, though, with confusing people because obviously when there's a game of rugby on, you don't yeah, want dogs running it. around off leash. Mm -hmm. So if we all of a sudden you're going to say you need the dog on leash, but we make it an unleashed area, it, they don't have to. Be. Yeah. So it's we need to summer kind of thing. Like, so you want to have summer like the beaches where we have a yeah. Summer. Yeah. Um, I, don't know. I mean, I just that. think that it's hard to know what the community, like most people were annoyed by the law <laughs> on this particular but one. Is there so like, I find, I mean, yeah. no, 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 there isn't really, no, I know, the, 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 so the time, this, this project won't look at like creating dog no. parks, but although there's interest, obviously it's yeah. you know, related mm -hmm. in people's minds, but that's a, a parks planning issue and there's, there is work underway and we know that there's interest in having an, an an area for dogs to exercise, but it's literally limited. It's the lack of space that's yeah. available for that purpose. Is is they, they won't make a, a sports ground a dog club because obviously for that no. reason no. it's actually a sports ground. Yeah. And so hence where we have, you know, on, on most of our parks that aren't reaching the environmental policy, uh, effective control. 
um, unless they're leased or prohibited. So mm -hmm. in this park, it's leased. So um, like, it's, it's possible that we could look at um, a, a leased requirement while games are happening on sports fields and while practices are happening and, and do that sort of situational one, but we'd have to think about whether that's mm -hmm. going to sort of work for people because I mean lots of the parks around the place they're a great place to exercise your dog and as long as you're picking up your dog then there's no there's no real problem the space is not being utilized at sports games aren't being played. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to get that balance of how that public space is used. So we have to road test that with the reserve committee. Are you is the rep on the reserve committee or can you so we've just got a question no, sorry I've just got a question here from Luana. Um, just a couple of questions. How you see these like sports grounds? I know it's just a bit of a suggestion. Oftentimes there are rubbish, uh, rubbish bins around. You know, people may not have bags with them, maybe have something available in those areas. Have just to have to. to yes, yeah, yeah, just yeah. to encourage people yeah. to use them for example, at the sports ground. Um, one of the things, issues we have um, at our beach is often we'll have signs up, but people will um, just ignore it. So, in terms of enforcement, um, I mean, I guess unless you know what the dog's registration tag number is or who the person is, it's really hard to. So there's sort of a process used for. So there is, there is I mean, dog registration is the best way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, if there's an issue that happens in these areas and, and you're able to come up with a car registration, then we have access to that as well. So there's, yeah. there's ways we can identify um, people that are causing you know, a nuisance that. And generally in the beaches and that, I mean, most of them, like the case playing that are all probably in the summer. Yeah. Uh, we do patrol them. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, when we're there, they're not yeah. there. And the, the best advice we give is to report it. Yeah. If, if mm. we don't know, then we can't mm. send people there, or we can't, mm. oh, this is, there's increasing complaints from this one key area, we'll prioritise it. All that sort of stuff all feeds into how. And even if you don't know who they are, still reporting it, it, it paints a picture of what's happening in an area mm. that, you know, we, we can look back on, especially in these occasions where we've started to review things, we can go back and look at the history of complaints. And, mm -hmm. I mean, yes. I, I could probably report that every day or something. Oh, yeah. Just through snaps in song, yeah? Uh, you can do it through, calling. yeah. Or calling, what's better for you? Uh, well, dogs in the primitive areas and stuff like that, that's fine with snaps in song. We, we don't want dog attacks or dog rushes going around. Oh, no, yeah. Those sorts of things, because snaps in soul is not an instant thing. It'll come through eventually. There's a right. part of the website where you can report those things as yeah. well. So if you see to see dogs, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll find the reporting thing. And that's got a map on it where you've got a pin for where it is mm -hmm. and you can report. Um, and that's certainly... Again, no, if dogs attack wildlife or people, then it's a fun thing. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Faster. away. Because we, we have a we have teams on seven days a week. So um, it's, mm -hmm. it's... And they the probably one call like that would be from three within the hour. Mm -hmm. Kathy, there's just a comment. Interesting situation. I had two little dogs on a lead on the beach, and I got told off for being there talking to someone. And there were dogs swimming in the beach, mm. and there were bigger dogs. Mm. I was like, okay, this is interesting, and it's intimidating for even the dog control person to have gone to approach people with their dogs in the water when it clearly says you can't be. But it was easy to come and talk to someone. Did you know this is the right thing to do? And I said, I am doing the right thing because you know I'm here with. But you know, yeah, that sort of thing with the big dog, small dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I thought that's pretty interesting. It just, I mean, even just taking yeah. you through what's in the policy, all, all dog owners are supposed to know yeah. what what the legal requirements right. are. Yeah. It's exactly. actually an obligation right. in the end. Break them in. Like, what do they do? Yeah. Are they going to come in? You know. Yeah, and there's only, I mean, there's realistically only so much yeah. we can do with budget limitations and things on, yeah. on education and mm -hmm. signage and information on the website, information mm. when you register, we, we, we do all of those things. But there's either people aren't interested or there's too much detail or it's, they think it's not relevant to them or they don't want to comply, they just want to do what they want to do. Yeah. Mm. And I'm, I'm really extremely surprised if anyone will tell you that uh, each kid will approach you or big dogs. Yeah, <laughs> that's day. right. I it's mean, just... you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, um, but we generally, uh, we don't, we don't have, um, Priority on types of dogs, and it's just really mm. And again, it's, it's yeah. a we, we, they ask for the week that we've got straight dogs, and it's just three out of Where it's more about are you aware? Because most people aren't. Yeah. Um, and so we'd rather educate people and give them the power to make those decisions that are uh, good for them and the rest of the community. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, obviously, if you got caught the next day, then it might be a different story. Yeah. But generally, most people are pretty good. So that's what our, our emphasis is on education. And this is definitely what the bylaw policy is about too, is being an educated tool, as well as a, you know, a regulatory tool. Well, sorry. I'm on the responsible of the Alzheimer's list too, by the way. Dangerous dog breeds. Are there, is there any requirement for muzzling or anything like that? Uh, there's no such thing as a dangerous dog breed. It's called menacing dogs. So there's yeah. dangerous dogs, but they're, they're classified by something you've done. Uh, your menacing dog breeds, yes, there are, and yes, they do. Uh, and we have a very high compliance with the city uh, with pit bull type dogs yeah. to the point where we don't see them very often. Especially in their pounds, we had 15 years ago that was all that was in their pounds. Um, and so, yes, there are restrictions around dogs by breed, but some people will, you'd be amazed at what some people will consider a pit bull type dog. <laughs> and they aren't. So, you know, it's again, it comes, all the time, exactly, it? yeah, it's bull breed type dogs often get, um, you know, branded with that, and I own one myself. So, you know, but we, we have a, we're very aware of uh, those requirements and we're very strict on them, mm -hmm. the council. Mm -hmm. Liz, oh. what do you do when we, um, on the boundary of a uh, territory authority, like we can mm -hmm. sell one um, quite mm -hmm. close to us, um, the north of the city has um, one of the areas, particularly a river, it's quite often the boundary goes down the middle of a river. So do you sort of coordinate with those neighbouring To some direct, we don't tend to do it across the Waymac, for example. No, but I mean, we'll, we certainly will talk to ECAN because they have regional parks that stop banks along the riverbank and we've, we've got some protections in for, um, you know, greater riverbank, nesting and we, birds and things like that. We um, have a we work very closely with the other council animal management teams. And for instance, the WIMAC, if it happens on the north side of the bridge, the WIMAC deal with it. it happens on the south side, it's ours. If it happens in the middle, well. Yeah, there is a, there's a slight push. I don't know if this yeah. is what you're talking about, but the, we can make bylaws for our district, which which leads to a weird quirk or something like the pier because it goes outside our district boundary, yeah. which is a certain distance down the coastline. But we also manage some reserve land in Selwyn, but because that's not in our district, we can't regulate it under dog control. But weirdly, we can under our parks and reserves by law because that's made under different legislation. So there's there's some slight oddities going on. Another thing I'm interested in, just one little prohibitive square on the spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, all down. Well, it's not a bad Hold on. Yeah, I was going to ask about how far that goes down the beach. Yeah. We've got Burnley Slate Esplanade Reserve, Burnley Slate Regional Park, Kaitaruhi Spit, Kaitaruhi River Esplanade, Lake Forsyth Mudflats area. Morris Recreation Reserve, Akuti Track, Tioka Regional Park, Tomodown mm -hmm. Bay, and Wadiwa Esplanade Reserve are the ones in that area. But some of it's in private land ownerships, so this yeah. is public places, so this is land under our control. And I know some of that land's not accessible. What about the beach, though, all the way down there? Like the waterfront. Um, if it's not on there, then it's not. So I just I read. So we tend to specify land parcels, so that the, the current okay. land parcels and their names. But if, if you've got an interest in us looking into that area more, then probably more so just asking, clarifying. Around. Did that answer your question? Yes, I did. I understand it's those that parcel of land, but yeah. Yeah. And is and more around the Birdlings, the Birdlings, Birdlings, Birdlings flat, Birdlings. where it ends up to the Lake Forsyth end, and it looks like it goes onto the beach. I'm just wondering what specific part of the beach that is, because I don't think anybody would probably Isn't know that. that. Is, that a, is there a mouth for the lake there? Yeah. Yes. That's what it will be. Just the, the Esplanade Reserve. For the, for the, the wild yeah. water the birds. Oh, okay. So, so sorry, I'm not familiar with all the land houses, but if, if we had the map and it was an interactive one, we could go into it and look at the areas that they are all the, the yeah. names of the land. Well, I just, so I just read out. Yeah, I just about the beach side as Thank well. You, yeah. So, yeah, um, from, from experience, none of the beaches prohibited apart from the mouth of the, um, the lake that comes out. 
And that will be around oh, that why we are not. Okay. What? Uh, what four 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 Foresight, yeah, 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 So, so we can look at that. We've, What's the last review we went through with our ornithologist and looked at high priority wildlife protection areas? So it may be that Doc is on the as is high priority, so maybe it's a little common thing, but it's still the wildlife protection applies everywhere anyway, but it could be public access. Realization that pest free. Yeah. Okay. If you're able to, it would help if you gave me detail on yeah. a bit of land. If you've got a snap of it or an image, that would be really helpful because we can absolutely look into that. Thank you. It is tricky because there is nowhere else really to walk dogs, and they're once again trying to look for somewhere to have a dog park. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah tricky. I don't want to point actually. Um, you mentioned something very interesting that. People instead of complaining, they mm -hmm. go on social media. Mm -hmm. So, does this policy even address, or is there any other segment that would address that aspect of it? Monitor social media. So, a lot of like when I say social media, a lot of people will comment on their neighborhood private residence page, residence page, or other, and they're not necessarily things that we had access to, and we wouldn't necessarily go through multiple years of the complaints and conversations that people have to pull that data. But we do. We will be consulting with everybody, so anyone can make a submission on any aspect of it. Um, but it's it's not something we have the resources to actively monitor, given all those different conversations. Um, in uh, this bylaw, is it blanket for pet and farm dogs, or is it just for pets? It, it regulates dogs, so the Dog Control Act requires all dogs to be registered, which includes working dogs. Yeah. Um. So, but, but mostly this is about. The policy is broader, it covers some other aspects, but this the, the areas regulated are public places so that anyone has access to so we don't regulate on, on private. So mostly it applies to uh, pets. Yes. There should there should always be an owner of a dog, a donor of a, and, and all the dogs are registered and microchipped. Um, but yes, if it's a working dog, so working dog and yeah, so disability yeah. dogs, yeah. um dogs used for biosecurity, uh police dogs, hunting, yeah. police dogs as it is. Um, and yeah, farm case control. There are some uh, references to farm dogs as far as, like, for instance, uh, dogs have to be on a leash on the road. Mm -hmm. Well, if the sheep dogs are herding, they must be on the road, then they're allowed on the road. Mm -hmm. They still have to be under effect control by the farmer, so they don't have to be leashed on that working side. Yeah. There is an exemption. Yeah, there's an exemption. Yeah, sorry, um, I should mention that. And, no okay. and there's an exemption under the Act where farm dogs, uh, working dogs, don't have to be <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so, and it's a choice, yeah? Microchip. Well, no, if they want them, yeah. we'll do them, but they yeah. don't, they're not obliged to, whereas so everybody else is. Yeah. That's under the Just act. working dogs, yeah. but all, dog, all other dogs. Yeah. Just rule working dogs. It's not a choice, it's the law, nationally, okay. not, not our law, national law. We had a drop in session just recently in Berlin Splat that um, Anita Osborne, police officer, along with I think it was Lionel, Lionel actually, really came along. And um, it was really good. I think a lot of people got very useful information about that, and especially about how to communicate roaming dogs. Mm -hmm. I think that was a really, really interesting one. Yeah. So a lot of people just go put it on the residence page and were hesitant to contact animal control. Yeah. But knowing that your first port of call is to go and take the animals safely to their owners and have a chat, that is so helpful to know. And that, this is also the value of microchipping, right? So even yeah. if your dog doesn't wear a collar at home and has escaped the fence and yeah. they're roaming, then we can pick the dog up, scan it, identify the owner and return it. So not all councils do that. Some councils will go straight to the pound. Yeah. We would, our aim is not to have to house and accommodate dogs and look out and go through a big Process and is to return them to the well, owner. Yeah. 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 Thank you for opening rules to the dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. I know so I could shoot them. Oh, yeah. oh good. Doing it again. Yeah. 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 yeah.
Oh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Luana, you got a question? Sorry, I'm just curious. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, what's the rationale between the exceptions as far as for working dogs not having to be? So if they so we were talking in the context before about herding sheep on the road. Yeah. So where the requirement for everyone is that dogs are on a leash, if the dog is working yeah. stop, then they're very well trained and they they need to be off leash to you take that function. So no kind of exception. Yeah, no. yeah. The microchip was a um, the microchip was a the microchip was a, a federated farmers uh, lobby well, in the days when they bought yeah. through, yeah. Yeah, the long time ago. So it's always been that way. Yeah. But there are a lot of farms out there that will choose to because it's it's quite good in a farm. Yeah. Right. when the bylaws everything gets sorted and it's been accepted, and this is the new thing. Um, I'm hoping there'll be some really good comms because I see that's where everything kind of falls down is at the owners, yep. owners side of it. It's in regards to how people understand the regulations and the rules and how do they then implement them. An example of that is people taking a you know an hour, an hour and a half trip to go out to uh, Tumbledown Bay and they get there and they see the sign saying no dogs, they can't leave their dog in the car. Um, and there's so many dogs that are there and I can completely understand when they get there, but they should have done the research beforehand. Yep. They even got in the car. So I'm hoping that you know when all of this, you, there's that money put in there for decent comms to get out to the owners so that they are aware of their responsibilities. So I just and support that. Yeah, we, I mean we absolutely do, do ongoing things in that area, but um, it, it's a it's always a challenge. I mean, it's never going to be easy because you don't know what information people want or where they're going to take their dogs, and it's not geographically based. It's anyone can take their dog anywhere, and yeah, yeah. I mean, you can, you can get people absolutely. that come from Salem yeah. and go there, and you know so. As much as we, you know, every dog owner will get consulted on this because they have to be before they, you know, be sent. But um, the information is available on, on the website. But we also try to be proactive about it. So we quite often will do uh, targeted education um, drops or posts on social media yeah. through Newsline. You know, we're, we're quite regularly using that. Uh, if the press choose to pick it up, that's great. But they don't always. But it's still available to the members of the community that are on that channel. Um, and also, any uh, communications that we do send out, we try to have snippets of education information on, on those areas on the bottom of it. Mm. And we're looking again at increasing that to, mm. just to get people's uh, attention and awareness that there, there is somewhere to go to look. Yeah. Great. Any other burning no, questions? Yeah. No. Obviously, a very hot topic for us all. I mean, yes. I have a dog. I've got a minute to schnauzer, so it's like, you know. Yeah. I mean, he can. He can. And I know that we're going to look at that cricket and you're playing Yeah. I saw something come up lately, but it's not, not our council. It's yeah. dog yeah. 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 But if you're going to be dog on the bus and then you took it off the bus, it'll be on the road. <laughs> <laughs> but we have it. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. And any other information you need from us in the future, don't hesitate to ask. Then the next update from us will be when we go out to consultation. So then we'll invite you to make submissions. So now we'll have yeah. all the detail on it. Um, yeah, it's just like to say too that if, if that drop in thing was, was successful, <laughs> then, you know, please let us know because we're more than happy to come and do that. So, for example, if one of our elected members have an area or people in their community who would like to have that to contact you, absolutely contact us. Contact Liz. Yes. Yes. We're part of a sort of outreach approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's value yeah. in yeah. supporting people to understand. Yeah. Yeah. We run a lot of education for children mm -hmm. in the city, within the city, and out here if they want it. Um, but, you know, it's, and, and workplaces, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're more than happy to do one offs as well, such as the Burdens, because it helps us as well. Yeah. yeah. No, it was very, very useful. Yeah. Good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the law's working, right? But like we don't see a lot of dogs. Uh, it's not. It's not, not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's working, but we have to, we have to look at yeah. it through a review. And yeah. so, and oh, yeah, review, course, we, course, we, course. we're not getting anything that needs to change. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And we won't change it for the sake of changing it. And we don't want to have bylaws here just for the sake of having bylaws. Last time around, we did remove some. Um, and so that's not out of the question too, where someone will come to us and say, look, do you really need this? Mm -hmm. And so one of them was the city, most of the CBD before 
2016 was prohibited. Oh, now yeah. the only part is the Botanical Gardens, really, and uh, yeah. well, yeah, yeah, there's We're very little. Yeah. It's now all leashed, so you can take your dogs to a cafe and sit down and have a coffee. Yeah. So that's what it was, and so we're not opposed to reviewing something what was good ten years ago and might not be good. Absolutely, everything's yeah. evolving. Thanks so much for your time coming out here. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Okay.